It looks like Santa Claus has been generous this year. Let's dig in and see what he's brought. Welcome back to Cloud42, I'm James. It's Christmas morning 2020, and that can mean only two things. First, because it lands on a Friday this year, it means it's deadlift day. I got up this morning and got my workout done, so now it's time for priority number two, which is opening presents. I did a video like this last year because I had a number of packages coming in anyway, and I was kind of out of time and ideas, but a lot of people really seem to enjoy it. In fact, I've gotten a number of questions about whether I'm gonna do it again this year. I'm happy to oblige because it's easy content, plus if I put affiliate links down in the description, it helps support the channel and maybe we can do this again next year. Well, let's see what Santa Claus brought us this year. So much tape. You'll probably remember in a previous video, I cleaned up a Chinese 5C collet chuck and got that mounted on my lathe. And these are 5C chucks to go with it. Uh, the, uh, or 5C collets to go with it. Of course, the collet chuck isn't much good without collets. This is 1.8, so these are imperial sizes. Let's see, does it say what the sizes are here? Uh, looks like 1.8 through one inch by 16 I opted to go with the 16th uh, size increments because generally I'm not going to be turning stuff down to specific dimensions and then trying to grab them. I'm mostly just going to be uh, trying to hold stock uh, in, that comes in nominal sizes in the collets. And so the 16th dimension should be fine. The 30 seconds or 64th increment seemed like overkill to me. So there's a set of Imperial 5C collets. And in this very similar size and weight box, we have metric collets. Uh, you know, we get a lot of flack for using imperial measurements uh, here in the US. And uh, don't worry, we get our suitable punishment and that is that we end up buying everything twice. So I've got here a set of imperial collets for holding imperial stock because that's generally what we find in hardware stores and metal suppliers around here. Don't generally find metric, uh, like metric diameter round stock is a specialty item and it's a lot more expensive. So that's why we go with that. And then, you know, I'm always having to grab things that are metric. I'll have something that's metric, I'll have a tool like I'm gonna modify the, uh, the jaw chuck or modify the scroll chuck um, key for the uh, collet chuck itself, and I need to hold it in something. Well, it's a metric diameter, so having a set of metric collets makes sense. Now, these collets will run not only in that collet closer, but it will, they will also run in my tool and cutter grinder, or my D-bit grinder. It uses 5C collets. And um, at some point, these will be great for uh, putting in a spindexer to run on a surface grinder. But James, you say, you don't have a surface grinder. I don't have a surface grinder yet. Okay, what's next? I don't know who wrapped these, but they taped everything on and made it more difficult. Okay, this is a set of 5C collet blocks. Got 5C collets. Might as well have 5C collet blocks. So I'm sure everybody's seen these before. It's, this is a square block and should be a hexagon one as well. And these allow you to just put in a 5C collet, 
tighten it down and then you can drop this in a vise on milling machine. You can stick it down in the mag chuck on a grinder uh, or hold this any place where you can hold square stock or hold you know, a square block. And then you can mill, like if you need to mill four-sided features, if you need to drill a through hole through a round part and do another hole at a 90 degree angle, you can mount it in here with a collet, drop it in the vise, make your, make your hole, rotate it 90 degrees, drop it back in the vise and make another hole. If you wanna put a hex head on something so you can turn it with a wrench, you just drop your round stock in the six-sided collet block and you can roll this six times in the vise and cut six features on it. Technically, you can roll it 12 times if you want. So it's poor man's indexer, but these just come in handy all the time. Now, if you didn't have a collet chuck, you can also chuck this up in a three jaw chuck or you can put the square one in a four jaw chuck and use it as a poor man's collet closer for the lathe. And then of course, these are the lock rings and the toggle lock handle for the back of that, back of the uh, collet blocks. And you'll see these showing up again. Now, I don't have them handy here, but uh, I do have a set of um, ER40 collet blocks that I've been using, and you may have seen those in a couple of videos. The problem with the ER40 collet block is that instead of the collet going inside the block, it has a big ring on the end uh, with a nut on it. Yeah, there got an ER40 collet nut here. And so it sticks out and it's larger than the block and it makes it so you have to hang it out over the end of the vise and it's just kind of unwieldy. You can't put it down on a table. So I think the 5C collet block is gonna be a lot handier. And since I've got 5C collets now, might as well have the blocks. Now these are not super high, uh, high dollar items. These are actually pretty inexpensive. Uh, I picked these up off of Amazon, they're of course Asian imports. But my experience with these, uh, especially with the ones that have a large enough bore that they're easy to grind the inside, um, tend to be pretty good. These are advertised as 5 tenths run out. Um, I don't know if they're really gonna meet that spec. A lot of this Asian stuff doesn't, uh, but you know, it, it comes close and is very serviceable, especially in a hobby shop. So it'll be interesting to see how well these run, but I expect that they'll be fine. open the long one next. And it's upside down. This is a changeable head torque wrench. So this is uh, 20 to 200 Newton meters, 10 to 150 pound feet. And it unlocks and then you've got a, it unlocks. And then you've got a nice uh, digital click adjustment here on the bottom. And uh, I've played with this a little bit and actually it's, it's pretty nice. I've been really happy with it. This came from uh, Maritool or Martool. And the reason I wanted to pick up a torque wrench, I actually have a torque wrench, an old craftsman, but I wanted something that I can use to adjust the, uh, the tension on collet nuts, on ER collet nuts, because I have ER20 and ER32 collet tool holders for my CNC mill. And it turns out that getting the torque set properly on the collet will affect runout. And so I wanted to have a torque wrench so I can set that properly. And like I said, this is a changeable head torque wrench. So we have a, an end for it that is for ER20 collets. Have one that is for the Castle Nut ER32 collets. And I have an end here, this 14 millimeter open end wrench, and this is for the uh, pull studs. So these just fit into the end. And then you can just clamp that on the nut and then use the collet wrench to set the torque. So I've got a tool right here. You hold this in a vise or in some kind of a fixture, drop that in and then you can set the torque on the nut or you can use the large bar to break them loose. Let me try not to break my carbide engraving tool here.
And then of course, if you want to actually tighten nuts on things, uh, you have to have a way to hold them. And this is a tightening fixture. This one came from numericalproducts.com. Uh, these are available on Amazon. I'll put a link down in the description. This one is for BT30, and about half of the tools that I run on the lathe are BT30. And you can bolt this down, or you can just put this in a vise, drop the tool in, and it gives a nice way to hold onto it. So in this case, you know, BT30 has drive dogs, so that just drops in, and then you can very easily adjust the torque. Now the ER30, or excuse me, the ISO30 is a little bit different animal. It doesn't have drive dogs, it just has these two small flats. And I have struggled and struggled and struggled to find a way to hold these. And in the end, you can just squeeze it in a vise. I'm a little bit worried about how that's influencing everything while I'm tightening it down, having that pressure just on the sides. But it seems to work okay. I did pick up one of these uh, roller bearing, one-way clutch tightening fixtures. And the idea with these is it's got a little one-way bearing. You can see the rollers in here. Maybe you can see the rollers in there. And so you just drop this in. And then when you turn it, it latches. So you turn it one way and it locks and you can loosen and you can tighten. And then it just lifts right back out. The problem is that these hardened rollers are actually leaving marks on the side of the fixture where they're or on the side of the tool holder where they bite in. I'm not super happy with that, so I'm still looking for another solution. If you know of a good solution for holding ISO 30 in a tightening fixture, let me know. But in the meantime, I've just been dropping it in the vise and gripping it across the flats. And then it's really easy. Just take the torque wrench, drop it on, and set the torque on the nut. Now, again, I would love to have something that works better than this. And for the BT30s, I can just put this in the vise and just drop them in and it works great. But for ISO 30, I still don't have a great solution, though this works. Okay, what's next? You probably noticed when I set up the mill in the previous video that it did not come with a DRO. And it looks like we have a solution for that problem. This is the uh, EL400, I believe. Yeah, so it's the EL404. Um, and so this is a mill-specific DRO from DRO Pros. I know they say Dro Pros. I yeah, it bothers me. Anyway, uh, from Dro Pros, and uh, you know, I haven't powered it up, and I don't have it installed. That will be coming. But so far, I'm actually pretty impressed. It's a it's a cast metal enclosure. This is the one I chose. This one because it has the separate quick zero for all of the axes, and the functions down here are mill specific. They have another one where you have to actually enter zero and assign it to an axis, as opposed to be able to just quick zero them. I also chose this one because it doesn't have a membrane keyboard. It has real rubber keys on it, and I like that. I've used uh, one on another mill in another shop that uh, had the nice rubber keys, and I really prefer that to the membrane keypad. This one is a three-axis unit, so you've got X, Y, and Z, but this particular mill, of course, has two Z axes. It has the quill, which has a little DRO in it that's kind of hard to read, a little LCD display. And then, of course, it has the Z slide, so the head goes up and down. So this is actually a four-axis DRO. It has inputs for X, Y, Z, and another axis uh, labeled U. So I can put the head slide on the Z axis, and I can put the quill on U. And then this can be configured to sum the two together. So I could lower the head and raise the quill and come back to my same number, and it should be physically at the same height. So. 
you know, in the end, if that doesn't end up being that useful, I can just select whether to show the quill here or whether to show the uh, Z slide here. But I know on my other mill that had a quill DRO, the little LCD one, it was really hard to use. And I didn't uh, enjoy that. I had to kind of, I'm tall enough that I had to kind of bend down and look at it. And I, I didn't really find that uh, easy to use. So I'm looking forward to having a nice bright uh, LED display for the Z axis up high where I can see it. And then with that, I opted to go with uh, magnetic scales. In fact, this particular DRO package comes with magnetic scales. And if you've not worked with these, uh, these are, I believe, IP67, so they can get coolant on them, chips can fall on them. I mean, I'll put guards over it so that that doesn't happen. But uh, these are pretty stout, and they can't get contaminated or dirty the way glass scales can if something seeps in. And they are a little bit easier to mount because the reed head's separate. And I've got a design put together for how I'm going to mount this on the uh, PM940 mil, and we will get to that in some future videos. I'm actually pretty anxious to get started on that, and uh, we will look at that soon. Okay, let's ugh. let's do the big one next. That is surprisingly heavy. Well, it's not that surprising for obvious reasons. Um, yeah, let me tell you. A package this heavy, this is about 70 pounds, moving this around with the wrapping paper on it without actually tearing the wrapping paper is a disaster. Nice coating of WD-40 on the bench helps significantly. And of course, you can already see that this is a big heavy box with the name Kurt on it, and that always means good things. <laughs> Team lift. Lifting it really isn't the problem. It's getting your fingers underneath it in order to start the lift that's the problem. This is a Kurt DX6, so this is the six inch vise, and uh, it is just a thing of beauty. Let me see if I can get some rags and get enough oil off of it that I can get it out of the box. I had uh, originally been thinking about going with a uh, different vise. I've actually had uh, some good luck with the the Shars Premium Vices, um, uh, the 440V is the one that I have over on my mill, and apparently they have a 690V, which is Shars kind of premium uh, mill vice. And uh, I seriously looked at that, but um, after thinking about it, I decided, you know, I've heard a lot of really good things about Kirk Vices. I have, again, you know, used Kirk Vices in another setting. I've never owned one in my own shop. And I decided to go ahead and give it a try. In terms of a you know, premium name brand vice, the DX6 is actually pretty reasonably priced. In fact, I picked this one up on Amazon and they delivered it in two days with pre prime shipping. I was impressed. So it comes with the handle, which of course you would expect. I just grab a piece of cardboard to set it on. Well, there we go. This is why I work out, so I can move stuff like this around the shop, and also so I can be a badass 70 year old. Just kind of looking around the edges, making sure this all looks good and 
Well, that sure is pretty. Okay, let me flip it over. Let's look at the bottom. So this uses Kurt's uh, sign lock key mechanism. So these are 5 8 inch round holes on the bottom and they make keys that fit into these holes that are round with a little o-ring to retain them that drop into the key holes here and then have square blocks on the end or rectangular blocks of different widths for different size table slots. So, um, you know, I've got 14 millimeter slots, so you can buy them. They're 16 in one direction, 14 millimeters in the other, and they just drop in. So you can drop two keys in here for putting the vise on in the traditional orientation, or you can drop keys in here and put it lengthwise on the table. And then the multiple different holes, you can bolt it down here, you can bolt it through here, or you can, you can put the sign keys in different places, and the purpose for that is to work with different work fixturing systems, different subplates that have different hole spacing. I did not buy the keys. I will get some or I will make some. They're, you know, like 60 bucks for a pair of keys. So I may try to make some, uh, see if I can make that work. Let me grab some precision flat ground stones. Let's stone the bottom of this off and go stick it on the vise. It feels great and it looks great. And these are sealing against it. You can sort of hear little sounds, little pucker sounds as it goes over these closed holes. Can you hear that? That's hilarious. Sure that's absolutely clean. In fact, let me pull this forward so I don't have to lean out as far with all the weight. I mean, it's only 70 pounds, it's not that big of a deal, but. And that will sit just about there. Get that more or less centered. That looks pretty good. I'm pretty happy with that. I think that is gonna work. I was a little bit you know, worried I, once I pulled the trigger on this thing and actually knew how big a vise I was getting. I was a little bit concerned about how that was gonna fit on this mill, but I am pretty happy with that. I think that is gonna be great. We're gonna be able to reach the entire length of this thing. Um, this does have the little plate that goes in here. Where did I put that? Little blue spring steel dust cover. Slide that in. Make everybody's life a little bit easier. So I just need to get some uh, get some studs. I've got the bolts that came with the package here, but I think. Yeah, I'm gonna wanna make some large washers here. Um, maybe some one inch diameter washers. So I will go grab some one inch rod and grab one of my new collets and throw it in the collet chuck and actually make some washers to bolt this down properly. But I think the very first things I wanna cut with this mill are gonna require actually bolting it down on the table to make some of the longer pieces for the DRO mounts and we will get started on that soon. And that leaves one present left. Let's open it.
This is a DJI Pocket 2 camera. So this is a little bit different than the things I normally feature on this channel, which are machine rela related. This is more YouTube and video production related. And I don't know if you've seen these. This is a uh, relatively recent. They had a, another version of this camera um, called the, I think it was just the DJI Pocket. Uh, I don't even remember what they called it. Anyway, this is the DJI Pocket 2. And what this is, is a stabilized camera with a gimbal. So let me power it on here. And it rotates and it is a stabilized camera. Let me turn it around so it's looking at you. And the idea is that I can move the handle and I can shake like, a, like an old man and it will actually keep the lens pointed in the general same direction and stabilize it so that you get a stable shot. And it's got a little camera on here. I have actually spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to get stable handheld shots. I've watched other YouTubers walk around with a GoPro camera just making everybody sick. It drives me nuts, I don't wanna do that. And so I've actually tried two or three different solutions. Let me turn this on actually start shooting some video here so you can see. In fact, you can see yourself there in my production monitor. I'm tilting this left and right and uh, see if I can do this. So I'm tilting this around, but your image should be relatively stable. You know, this is just the latest uh, incarnation in my attempts to come up with a good stabilized handheld gimbal. I've tried some other things. I can show you what I've tried and not been super happy with the first thing that I tried to use was this Hohem uh, iSteady Pro. And this is just a motorized gimbal, very much like this little camera that I'm using right now to shoot this. Um, but you clamp a GoPro into it and then it's a larger gimbal with you know, batteries in it and a stabilization system. And it works okay. The last time you saw this is back when I was uh, doing my video making PPE for um, for the pandemic response and I did some walk around handheld shots in my lab upstairs and I just was not happy with it. It did not dampen any of the, any of my kind of old man shaking. That really did not work very well at all. And it also has some weird glitches in it. You get into certain situations and it would like, was like it would sort of hit the end of its travel and then jerk and yeah, I, I wasn't happy with that. So the next thing I tried is I bought into some of the hype around the GoPro Hero 8 and the uh, image stabilization in this thing. So I picked one of these up and uh, played around with it. You would have last seen some uh, handheld shots of my work on the uh, squat rack with this. And honestly, I also was not super happy with that. Again, any kind of shaking in my hand translated right through to it. Um, you know, maybe this is great if you've got it on a helmet and you're flying off of the side of a mountain, but I did not find it to be that useful for what I was doing. And we'll see, you know, when I get the footage from this camera in to see if this one is any better. I can also show you a couple of other things that I didn't wrap up because they were very large and I didn't want to deal with it. Um, this is my welder. I've actually had this for a few months. This is something that I picked up um, in order to do the brackets to mount the fog buster. And uh, so you've seen a little bit of my welding. You've never seen the welder. You've never seen me actually welding on camera because I am terrible at it. Uh, but this is a Miller Synchrowave 210. So this is an AC-DC welder. So we've got AC TIG, DC TIG, DC stick, and then I also got the one that comes with the, uh, with the spool gun. So this will run flux core or gas shielded aluminum or steel wire. So you can run the aluminum wire just with the uh, argon like you would with TIG, or you can do um, uh, you know, other kinds of mixes uh, like a carbon dioxide mixes for, for steel gas shielded. I'm not that familiar with it. I'm, I'm gonna have to learn. Or you can actually run flux core in this, or you can just run you know, aluminum wire, which is probably what I'll do the most with it, but we'll see. Right now I've got it set up, you know, it comes with a 150 amp uh, TIG torch, which you know, makes a lot of sense, 150 amp torch on a 200 amp welder. Um, and I did pick up this welding table. This is also a Miller, I believe it's their ArcStation brand. 
And this is just a little folding uh, welding table. The top is actually pretty flat. It's pretty solid. And I can fold this up and it's got wheels here so I can wheel it away and lean it up against a wall in the corner, which is great because I don't have a lot of room in my shop. And then they were running a package deal with the Miller Digital Performance uh, Helmet, and that has actually worked really well for me. I did discover that if I'm running a low current arc for thin sheet metal and I have it on the lowest sensitivity setting, uh, it's easy to get flashed, but you turn the sensitivity up a little bit and it works great and it's very reliable. So that's my welding outfit. The one other thing that I picked up recently is this. This is a hypertherm plasma cutter. This is the PowerMax 30 XP. And um, I picked this up originally because I wanted to try it for cutting holes in sheet metal enclosures like NEMA enclosures for mounting fans and things for VFD installs. Uh, but I also picked one that, that will um, work on the circuits I have here in the shop. And this doesn't have a high frequency start, so it should be suitable for CNC. So if I want to either buy or build a CNC plasma table at some point, I should be able to use that for this. So why did I pick this welder and this particular uh, plasma cutter? It's because the largest circuit that I have here in the shop is 30 amps. I could maybe put in a 50 amp 220 circuit, but I only have a 100 amp panel. It's completely full. I really would need to upgrade the service here in the shop if I wanted to go more than that. And this will run on a 30 amp circuit. The only other kind of 200 amp class welder I could find that was spec to definitely run on a 30 amp 220 circuit is the HTP um, uh, 221 dual voltage, and those were just unobtainium at the time I purchased this. So that's ultimately why I picked this. It is going to mean I'm not going to be welding, welding half inch thick steel plate unless I'm, you know, stick welding multiple passes with a preheat, which, you know, could be done if some point if I actually take a class and learn how to weld. But for now, this is going to be used for, you know, eighth inch, maybe up to three sixteenths or quarter inch aluminum. Um, and that's primarily what I'm gonna use it for. Unfortunately, there are a number of things that are on their way but haven't made it here yet. I've been on Stan Zinkowski's waiting list for a Hotshot 360 heat treating oven for about five months now, but he's been having supply chain issues just like everybody else, and so that's taken a while, but it looks like that is now on its way and should be here soon. And of course, what good is the ability to heat treat steel parts if you don't also have the ability to grind those parts in after they're heat treated? So I found a Herrig Super 612 surface grinder used, and that is on a truck somewhere on its way here. And when it gets here, you'll get to see that. That'll turn into a video or more likely a series of videos. Not sure yet how much work it's going to require to get that tuned up and running, but when I get to that project, you'll see it here. If you enjoyed this video, please give me a thumbs up, feel free to subscribe to the channel, and leave me a comment. I'd like to know what you think. What did you get for Christmas? Put it down in the comments. Thank you for watching.